If you're watching this video, you might have an AI learning addiction. And this video is your intervention. If you're suffering from this, then you might have around 20 tabs open right now. Half watch tutorials, five newsletters that you swear you read on a daily basis but never do, and a Google Sheet filled with tools and models that you're tracking because you're someday gonna try them. You're not falling behind because you don't know enough. You're falling behind because you're constantly learning instead of applying what you're learning. So close those tabs and cancel that brand new course you just started that you were gonna not finish anyway. Because in the next few minutes, I'm gonna walk you through a mental model that I use to cut through the noise that will tell you exactly what's worth learning, what's worth ignoring, and how to finally get off of the AI tutorial hell hamster wheel. Let's break your addiction. So if you've identified yourself as someone who is afflicted with AI learning addiction, then this might be a good selfie of you, where you're constantly on this hamster wheel, learning from any then tutorials, make.com tutorials, prompt engineering, and every single YouTube video that you see the word insane in that you feel drawn to to have to click. And what happens is you keep learning 5%, 8% of whatever it is you're trying to learn, but you never actually apply it. And if you look at online learning, let alone AI online learning, you have around a 3% course completion rate on online websites like Coursera. So that's the equivalent of you signing up for a course, doing the welcome module, and maybe one or two more, and then completely forgetting about it. And the ironic thing is, you venture out to learn brand new tools, even though you keep going back to the same two to three tools, but you never go deep enough on those tools to get the full AI leverage to replace whatever else you were looking at. So if I were to frame this a lot more eloquently, I'd call it the 30 to one learning crisis, where you spend 30 hours learning, but only one hour actually doing the thing. So you end up with the equivalent of 50 half-built bridges, but they're really half-built bridges of information and knowledge, where you don't even get the chance to get to mastery, let alone intermediate, and you're always stuck in the beginner phase. My goal with this video is that you go from consumer to creator and from learning to leveraging. And to get straight into it, to make sure that this video is not additional fluff for you, this is essentially the way I think about the learning pyramid. I've said this in other videos and I stick with it constantly, which is level one is basic prompting to intermediate prompting to advanced prompting. And I think that all roads always lead back to prompt engineering. Whether you're going to vibe code, whether you're gonna create AI images or AI videos, you're always gonna need this skill. So this is for me, the foundation of everything. Once you've actually learned the foundation, then you ideally wanna customize it. And this goes back to typical school where you learn the concept and then you apply the concept to your own use case and that helps you really learn it and go from a novice to someone who actually knows how to wield it. Once you've made this technology or software or model your own, meaning you've actually applied it for things that matter to you and will actually move the needle for you, that's where ideally, if you can, you wanna to try to actually automate with it. Try to actually buy back your time with whatever it is you're trying to learn. So if it's prompt engineering, then learn that every single time you do a task more than five times and it's a similar task, it could probably be some form of custom GPT or a cloud project. If you find yourself wanting to respond to everyone that downloads your lead magnet and you do it manually, then it might make sense to actually try to create a workflow automation with very basic nodes to take the information, draft a personalized response and send it back. And assuming that whatever you've automated has legs, then maybe you could make either an internal based tool just for you or a tool that could be shared amongst your team, or you never know, a tool you could actually go and sell as a micro SaaS. And the end goal is obviously to apply it, but to apply it, you have to go through these stages to actually learn the thing, make it your own, automate with it if applicable, and then build with it either for yourself, others, or external customers. And then this leads to actually applying the knowledge that gives you tacit knowledge. And tacit knowledge is t knowledge that you can only acquire by doing the thing and having experiential learning. And if you wanna get more tactical about this, then steal my LEAP decision matrix. And LEAP stands for leverage, extraction, application, and payback. So in a way, this gives you a lens as if you're looking at learning as an investment versus some form of hobby. Now L stands for leverage, meaning can you learn a skill that multiplies and applies across the board? And very shortly, I'm gonna walk through this quadrant down here that'll break through what is a super skill, what is a nice to have, and what is a time sink. The E in LEAP stands for extraction. So this is really the 80-20 Pareto principle concept where can you derive tons of value without spending the 10,000 hours to become 100% core expert at the thing? So if this were vibe coding, for example, then a lot of the 80% of the value is learning how to prompt it, 
how to identify how to change the colors and the design and adding super base or adding some form of database to the back end and maybe creating some automations or workflows associated with the vibe coded app and this would be let's say the 80 20 where the 20 percent is you building for production or you building for multiple people at scale and then realizing that you're missing some additional meta skills this next one is a huge one and it's one that most people refuse to actually acknowledge which is application so if we have gbt6 come out or claude 5 come out and then the world says it changes everything once again do you actually have a tactical use case for any of the new advancements other than better copywriting or better code? If a brand new tool comes out that automates something like Graphrag, which is very complicated, and you have a business of five colleagues and you service 10 customers and you have a knowledge base of maybe three to 400 pages, should you drop everything and learn this brand new thing because someone said it's crazy and changes everything? The answer, most likely, would be no. And the last one you could look at is payback. And you can think of this as if you're an investor. In the investment world, PE world, there's something called a payback period where if I roll out a capital allocation or I invest $3 million, how long will it take for me to get my money back over what time horizon? Now in that world, three to five, seven years is something reasonable. But in this case, if you're learning a brand new tool, model, or framework, can you derive any value that will pay you back for the time that you invest in 30 days? I see people all the time hopping into my community, other communities, saying I spent 20 days learning this one workflow in NADN about social media automation so I can create these AI slop videos that I can post on TikTok and make $5. And for some reason, I'm stuck at this node I don't know what to do. And then I'll ask the question, oh cool, are you a marketing agency? Are you a social media agency? What aspirations do you have? And sometimes the honest answer is, this looked really cool, I wanted to try it, it looked like I could make some money with it. And while I'm sure you could probably make some money with it, if you don't have a core focus for why you're doing the thing, then one, as soon as you encounter difficulty, the likelihood that you quit is very high because there's no actual momentum or end goal that you're using with other than some form of fat. And the key thing with this framework in general is it needs to be unanimous. You can't have three out of four or two out of four yeses. If you're limited on time, which the majority of you I'm sure are, then you have to be very respectful of your own time to what you invest. And ideally, if you invest 30 days into something, then you should be at least intermediate at it within 60 to 90 days. And the good thing about mastery, especially in the Gen AI space, is it's kind of like math. Once you learn enough math, you can generalize that math accordingly. Same thing with, let's say, prompting images. If you're an expert at mid-journey and GPT images, and then you now wanna learn video prompting, it's derivative of that same technique. So you could have invested 90 days in one, but now you can learn the next skill in five days or 10 days. And ending off with this quadrant I promised you, we have super skills, nice to haves, time sinks, and hacker skills. On super skills, these are the skills that multiply, like we saw before. So I always harp on prompt engineering because it's never let me down and every new thing in Generative AI just requires me to apply my existing expert skill set at prompting and just apply it to a brand new domain. And especially if you can do things like AI research, then if you know prompt engineering, then you can go back and forth with something like a perplexity or a research assistant and basically cheat time by having AI read documentation, watch YouTube videos to help you prompt apps that you might not have experience with. But because you have the core skill set, you can leverage the hack of AI research with your prompt engineering to pretty much learn how to use any generative AI app because all of them involve some form of natural language. It's just a matter of what dialect that natural language is. Is that dialect text, image, video, music, text to workflow from NADN or Lindy? From one core skill set, you can derive all kinds of applications. And the same thing applies to workflow automation tools. So irrespective of whatever camp you live in, you don't need to learn NADN and Make and Zapier. You just need to learn one, ideally one that you think you're interested in, one that the UI kind of speaks to you and the learning curve isn't that steep. Now my hypothesis here is this prompt engineering is gonna help you learn the skill as well because if you've seen my prior videos on the new text to workflow feature from NADN that's rolling out, in six months to a year, everyone will be able to prompt an automation and it will really be about just adding your credentials, hooking everything up and testing that it works the way you expect it to work. So once again, the reason why prompt engineering is in dark green is as everything now starts to go into a text to workflow format, whether that's vibe coding, automation in general, 
prompt engineering will still always be this evergreen skill. It'll just be a matter of how much prompting you need to do and how much AI will assist you with that refinement of that prompt. Now in the nice to haves category, this is something that I like to harp on a lot in my community because I like to look at the second step, not just the foundations. That's what gets me excited, which is not building the vibe coded app that takes you to 80%, but how do you go from the 80% to the 100% and actually deploy it in a way where people could actually test it and you could go to the next level. And this is where you start involving things like GitHub and understanding Cloud Code or Windsurf or Cursor or all of them to help you take something that's decent and make it great. Another thing is custom GPTs and cloud projects. And these are just examples. There are many versions of these two tools that you can use as well. With custom GPTs, you can apply your learning of workflow automation as well as prompt engineering. And with cloud projects, you can start to really understand now another meta skill, which is MCP servers. So you don't just focus on MCP servers because that's a rabbit hole of its own. And if you're not technical, it's a very deep rabbit hole. But if you use MCP servers that help you perfect or master cloud projects, then now you have a really nice feedback loop. So maybe you see something repetitive that you think is worthy of automating via a cloud project. And then you sprinkle on an MCP server to help you superpower it, whether it's web scraping with Appify or connecting to a Google Sheet or a Notion file. These are the additional incremental things that are nice to have skills on top of your core foundation. Now, this next one is a skill that I don't use day to day and I don't use week to week, but once in a while, especially when a client comes with a very interesting scenario, fine tuning models, having that skill set of knowing how to fine tune even a basic model from OpenAI will help you really understand the nuances of where the boundaries lie between prompt engineering and where it actually makes sense to fine tune the underlying model itself instead of doing a back and forth of the prompt engineering and dealing with something that's called model drift, where essentially over time, these models keep changing. So the same prompt that worked six months ago doesn't work the same way today. And next up we have database and UI design, where this is a deeper skill, database design. So understanding that if you're creating an app, right, then if it's user facing and you're doing something, let's say using generative AI, where you enter a simple prompt and it does something in that app, then you should have an understanding of, okay, we need a customer table. We need a profile table. We need a way to tag each one of the messages. It might make sense to create a conversations table. And this is something that was strictly for maybe data engineers or data analysts or data scientists in the past. But today, because you can use things like Superbase MCP servers and other database servers, you can basically just ask for whatever tables you want and it will write the SQL you need to create those databases. And UI is obviously a nice to have, where if you know how to take something looking like it's AI generated vibe coded app and make it your own and make it look like an actual designer put it together using different techniques like 21st.dev MCP servers, using websites that allow you to copy paste prompts like aura.build and taking a very mediocre looking app and making it look more world-class is a meta skill, but it's not a priority. It's not something that you should prioritize ahead of all the fundamentals here. Now, in terms of time sinks, these are skills that are useful. You could probably make money with them depending on the industry, environment, country you're in, but I wouldn't say they're priorities because they might be popular now because they're new, but just because they're new doesn't mean that they're gonna be evergreen in utility. And the one I'm gonna harp on specifically are AI generated videos where every single day I'm either logging into Instagram or TikTok and I'm seeing yet another channel that has AI generated videos over and over again. And while it's funny now, it's unique now, in three to six months, we're all gonna be craving normal human generated content from the volume of slop that's going on the internet. So if you're joining communities or obsessing about this 65 node n and n workflow that makes ads for UGC creators, even though you don't have a marketing agency, you don't plan on selling to ad agencies, and you're just doing it because it's cool and you have been told you could make money with it, probably not the first thing you should invest your time in, especially if your time is scarce. And then the other ones, again, they're not criminal to learn, like complex rag, that's a skill that I have because I've had to learn that skill with enterprise clients. It's not a skill that I was actually praying that I would have to learn. And when it comes to every new model release, it's not your job to look at every single one from GPT 4.1 to GPT 4.15 to GPT 4.5 and understand every single difference between those models unless there's one big huge impact that changes the way, I don't know, you create a video from scratch where we couldn't before, you can create, let's say, Nano Banana, where you 
edit pictures in a way that you couldn't before. If it's not something incremental, and more importantly, not something incremental that actually affects your day to day, then even though it's tempting to want to click on that video, even if it's my video, it's not worth clicking it if you're not going to learn something tactical. And the last section I call hacker skills. And there could be, by the way, a hundred skills I could list here because all of these again are useful. All of these are skills that I've acquired over time because I've had to, or I've built something where I had to learn this micro skill. But the idea is, is that you're not optimizing for learning the micro skill. The micro skill is something you learn along the way, ideally learning the things that matter in the super skills category, or at least in the nice to have category. So when it comes to, for example, MCP servers, this is not about using MCP servers. It's about building your own because it doesn't take too much coding, even if AI is doing it for you, to turn a normal function into an MCP server that you can use. So over time, you don't even have to depend on a lot of these third party providers, many of which could not be secure, and you could theoretically build your own. But without getting into the minutia of it, the idea here is that don't obsess about building MCP servers because it's a skill you don't have, or you have that skill gap or knowledge gap. If you don't even know how to apply them here, in cloud projects or custom GBTs. So the idea is learn this eventually when it makes sense to, but don't make this your aim or don't carve out six hours on a Saturday to learn exactly how to build an MCP server when you don't even know how to use them or have, they haven't used enough to learn what is a good MCP server and what is a bad MCP server. And the last part here are tricks of the trade that I call micro hacks where they are small by the ways that could help you hack something in any then. So it's that much faster to do X, Y, Z. In many cases, I do recommend learning things the old fashioned way, because if you learn it the old fashioned way, you have all the fundamentals you need to then mix remix with micro hacks that you learn along the way. And that's pretty much it. I didn't want to dwell too much on this topic, but I felt it was important to bring up because I get a lot of questions every day on how I manage to keep up with everything, even though the goal is not to keep up with everything, is to keep up with what will take you personally to the next level. If you found this helpful, let me know down in the comments below. And if you want to be in an ecosystem that helps you avoid the time sinks and focus on the super skills, then check out Early Adopters, the first link in the description below. I'll see you in the next one.